We all have questions in life. You know, you have questions every day. Maybe you're in a new place and you want to find a good place to eat, so you go over to Google, go over to Yelp, hey, what's a good place to eat? And read the reviews of a bunch of random people you've never met before and somehow think that's a reliable source. Or maybe you're thinking of going to see a film, so you check out Rotten Tomatoes and want to make sure the film you're going to go see is fresh. Or maybe you wonder what the weather's going to be, so you pull out your weather app. But then a lot of times people would just go to Google and ask questions about things that are troubling them. I, I read an article uh, about actual questions that were sent to Yahoo Answers. These are actual questions. They're not jokes. I'm not making these up. People actually type this in hoping for an answer. One person asked, what does fall 2000 mean? Uh, means fall 2000. How about this one? I like it. Is there a spell to become a mermaid that actually works? Someone actually asked this. Strangely, it was signed L. Lusco. Levi asked that question. Levi, no, the answer is no. Somebody else actually asked this question. How do I take care of my pet potato? Why do you have a pet potato? Is its name Spud? I mean, look, just cook it and eat it. That's how you take care of it. How about this one? I'm not making it up. How much Listerine does it take to get drunk? Um, probably not a lot. You'll smell great and you may die. Here's another one. Can I lose weight without moving? Sadly, I sent that question in myself and I, I didn't get a very good answer. Newsflash, Yahoo Answers and Google and Surrey, they can answer some of your questions, but they can answer the big questions. But I'll tell you who can. Jesus Christ has the answer to the biggest questions of life for you tonight. He has the answers. And we all have questions we would like to ask God. How wonderful it would be to sit down and just have a cup of coffee with Jesus and say, hey, I, I had a few things I wanted to ask you about. Because things happen in life that don't make sense, right? USA Today did a survey among its readers and they said, if you could ask God or a supreme being anything you want and know you would get a direct answer, what would you ask him? 19% said, I want to know if there is life after death. 6% wanted to know how long will I live and 34% wanted to know what their purpose on life was, or purpose of life was. Well, 2000 years ago, a guy named Nicodemus managed to snag an appointment with Jesus at night. Nicodemus met Jesus at night. That's right, Nick at night for sure. And he sat down and asked Jesus the big questions of life. And I'm going to look at those answers Christ gave to him. But here's the big questions I want to address tonight. Number one, why am I so empty inside? Why do I have this big hole in my heart? What is the meaning of life? Why am I here on this planet? What happens after I die? And why am I so lonely? And finally, who let the dogs out? No, that's a stupid song. I don't even care. Okay, so let's deal with the first one. Why am I so empty inside? Jesus actually answered this question with a woman who came to draw water from a well a long time ago. This woman had been married and divorced five times and she was shacking up with some guy. So clearly she thought that men and sex was gonna fill the void in her life. And so she's drawn some water and she sees this stranger at the well. It's 12 noon. Uh, that's not normally when you would go to draw water, but because she was sort of an outcast, she went all by herself. And here is this stranger she doesn't recognize, who in fact is Jesus Christ, God in human form. And as she's drawing the water, he says, hey, if you drink of that water, you'll thirst again. And he started talking to her about living water. In other words, he talked to her about that deep spiritual thirst he had. He was using the well as a metaphor for life itself. If you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. You could write that over the well of success. If you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. You could write it over the well of experiences. If you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. 
And she said, well, tell me, where can I get this living water you're talking about? He says, if you drink of this water, you'll be thirsty. Speaking of the water in the well. But if you drink of my water, it will bubble within you, giving you eternal life. That's it. She was asking, how can I satisfy the thirst in my soul? You know, we're all searching in life. We're all searching for something. A lot of people are searching for Pokemon. I hope they find them. But the rest of us are searching for things that are far more important than that. And think of all the rock stars and all the actors or pro athletes who've had immediate success. They have what many just dream of, uh, fame and they get a lot of money. And yet think of how many of these people have overdosed on drugs or alcohol or have committed suicide. That's because if you drink of those wells, you'll thirst again. I came upon a collection of all these names of people that had overdosed on drugs, going back to 60s icons like Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin. They all died at the age of 27 of drug overdoses. Elvis Presley died at 42 of a drug overdose. Saturday Night Live comedian John Belushi died of cocaine and heroin overdose at 33. Chris Farley, the comedian, idolized Belushi, and he was also a star of SNL. And he died at the same age, 33, of cocaine and morphine overdose. River Phoenix, a promising young actor, died at 23 of a cocaine and heroin overdose. Model Anna Nicole Smith died in 2007 at the age of 39 of multiple prescription drug overdoses. Actor Keith Heath Ledger died at 28 of multiple drugs in this system. Amy Winehouse died at 27 in 2011 of alcohol poisoning. Rocker Scott Weiland died in 2015 of a drug overdose. Corey Monteith of the Glee TV show died of a heroin overdose. Actor Philip Seymour Hoffman, who was in Hunger Games, among other films, died of a heroin overdose in 2014, and they found him with a needle sticking in his arm. Whitney Houston died of a cocaine overdose in a bathtub. Tragically, her daughter, Bobby Christina, died in the same way at age 22. Michael Jackson died of a drug overdose, and now most recently, musical legend Prince has died from a drug overdose. These people had it all. They had the fame, they, they had the money, they had the influence, and they turned to these hardcore drugs. Listen, if fame and answer brought answers, why would they end up this way? So let's come back to the question. Why am I so empty inside? Here's why. God created you effectively with a hole in your heart. And there's nothing this world offers that will fill that hole. And only God can fill that hole, if you will. The Bible says God has placed eternity in our heart. Now that's unique to people. That's unique to human beings. You know, the animal kingdom doesn't search for the meaning of life. Dogs don't lay around and ask, what is the meaning of my life? Why, uh, as a dog, am I here? You know, I've tried everything this world has to offer. Chasing cats, eating roadkill, drinking blue toilet water. Nothing is satisfied. No, dogs don't think things like that. A cat would never care about the meaning of life. But people think about it a lot. You think about it all the time. Why am I here? The clock is ticking. Life is passing. And you're thinking, what am I here for? Why am I empty inside? You're empty because you were designed and wired to know God and only He can fill that big old space in your heart. That's why you're empty. And you can walk out of here tonight with your thirst quenched and the hole filled. Number two, what is the meaning of life? That's a big one. I, I started asking this question at a very young age. It's because I had to grow up fast being raised in, in an alcoholic home with a mom that was absent, no father really to speak of. I was searching for purpose and meaning in my life, thinking there's got to be more to life than this. I, I looked at the adult world that I was around. They were raging alcoholics who would scream and yell and throw things. And I thought, I don't want to end up like them. So why am I here? And so 
as a young boy, I started experimenting. I got into the party scene. I started getting drunk. And then I got into drugs. I heard that drugs will make you more aware. And it was true. I took drugs and I was more aware of how empty I was. I'd smoke weed every day. Take LSD on the weekends. Hey, we're having some fun now. But I was searching. I didn't know what I was on this earth for. And for me, it became a process of elimination. Even before I became a Christian, I saw the dead end street of drinking. And I certainly saw it in drugs with some of my friends who were already seeing their lives unravel. And I saw the effects in my own life. So if it wasn't in those things, I thought, where is it? It's not in the world of affluence I've seen my mother live in. Where is the answer? Well. I used to hang around down in Newport Beach and um, try to look tough. I'd have my hair hanging in my eyes. Use your imagination. And I remember seeing Christians down there that would be handing out their little religious booklets. And I was always thinking, come and talk to me. I want to talk to you, but I'm too proud to ask for help. And I don't know why, but the Christians would look at me and say, ah, no, forget him, you know. And they would give me one of their little booklets. Here, here, here. They sort of shove it in my direction and I'd take it like I didn't care shove it in my pocket but I never threw those little booklets away I took them home and I had a drawer at home in my uh, chest of drawers I thought of it as my God drawer <laughs> anything religious I threw in the door drawer so I had you know religious literature from every group imaginable from Christians and from Hare Krishna people and from uh, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, anything anyone gave me that was religious, I threw it in the drawer. And every now and then I'd take the drawer out and I'd empty out, empty it on my bed. And as a 16 year old boy, I would sit there trying to figure it out. How can I find life's meaning? And, and these things would sort of contradict each other. Then I had a poster hanging on my wall. It was very popular back in those days. It's called Desiderata. Ever heard of it? I had it hanging on my wall. Here's what the poster said. Therefore, be at peace with God, whatever you conceive him to be. Whatever your labors and aspirations and the noisy confusion of life, keep peace with your soul. With all the sham, drudgery, and broken dreams, it's still a beautiful world. What? Who writes this stuff? But I didn't know. I thought, well, I'm going to try to live by that. Yes, I, I want to have peace within my soul, but I didn't know how to find it. And my experience was life was not so beautiful. So I'm eliminating all these things. And I'm at, at a high school here in Southern California. And I transferred over there. And I actually transferred over there to become a different person. I was going to one school called Corona Del Mar High. And, uh, and, and I didn't want to be in that scene anymore. I wanted to get fully immersed in the drug culture. I wanted to go as far into it as I could and explore it. Not because I wanted to be a druggie, but because I thought I could find answers there. And as I sort of explored that culture, I saw the emptiness of it. But something that was happening on my high school campus that I wasn't planning on was a bunch of very outspoken Christians because the Jesus movement was happening and all these kids were following Christ. And one of my friends, one of my friends said to me, Lori, careful, there's a lot of Jesus freaks on this campus. I said, oh right, as if Greg Laurie is going to become a Jesus freak. What can I say? So I dismissed these Christians. I thought, they're nuts, they're weird, they're strange. But then there was this really cute girl. And I saw a friend talking to her. I'd never met her before. It's not like she was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen, but there was something special about this girl. And I wanted to meet her, so I walked up and I was waiting for a break in the conversation. And they're chatting away. And, and I, I looked down and noticed she has, you know, a textbook for a class. And she has a couple of other books and so forth. And then I noticed she has one of these books, you know, black leather cover, ribbon coming out of the bottom of it. And I went, oh no, it's a Bible. She's a Jesus freak. What a waste of a perfectly cute girl. Well, I said hello to her. Then the next day at lunchtime, I thought, where is that cute Jesus freak girl? So I started walking across the campus and I found her sitting with her Jesus freak friends. 
in a circle singing their Jesus freak songs. And I thought these poor, sick, demented people, just look at them, these dumb smiles, this joy, too bad they can't be cynical and miserable like me. And then a thought occurred to me, a thought I'd never even considered before. What if they're right? <laughs> Dismissed it immediately. No way they're right. No way you can believe in Jesus and have him come in your life. That's ridiculous. It's fiction. But then the thought came back. Yeah, but what if they're right? Look at your life. It sucks. Look at their life. It rocks. Look at the difference. What if it's true? Then a guy got up to speak, his name was Lonnie. Funny thing, he had long shoulder length hair, parted in the middle, and a full beard. This dude looked like Jesus. Now I'm like, whoa! And he starts talking about Christ, reading from the Bible. I don't remember most of what he said, but he said one thing that stuck with me. He said, Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. And I looked around at the Christians, I said, well, they're for him. Does that mean I'm against them? Hey, I didn't want to be against them. And then he said, get up right now and come down here and pray and ask Jesus in your life. And I thought, there's no way I would ever do that. And about a minute later, I was up there praying. Last thing I planned on doing. And that was the day I found the meaning of life in Jesus Christ. And this is the night you can find meaning in life as well. You say, yeah, but what is the meaning of life? Why am I here on this planet? One author wrote, quote, life has no meaning. It's a waste to be asking the question when you are the answer, end quote. How stupid is that? You are not the answer. In fact, you're part of the problem. That's because the Bible does not teach that the answer is within. The Bible teaches the problem is within. It's our heart. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things that's desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? So when people say, well, I'm just following my heart, man. Hey, be careful. Your heart will take you the wrong place. You need your heart to be changed. You see, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. You need to have your sin forgiven. And then you can find the meaning of life that you want so desperately. You know, we set goals in life. When we're young and we're single, we say, well, you know, I'm not very happy, but one of these days I'll get married and then I'll be happy. And then you get married. Okay. Now if I could just kind of get a different spouse, then I would be happy. So you get divorced and you remarry. All right. Well, that's not as good as I thought it would be. If we could just have some kids, then I would be happy. You have children and you have children. Then you're like, if we could just get rid of these kids, we'd be, they're 50 and still living in the basement. I, you know, it's always just beyond your reach. Oh, if I get this promotion, yeah, if I get this opportunity, but you come back empty, 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 your problems follow you. See, here's the thing. You need to have your sin forgiven. And God has sent a solution. 2,000 years ago, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, on a rescue operation for you and for me. And he died on the cross for our sin. Now you might ask, well, who cares if he died on a cross? What is that? That was his problem. What does that have to do with me? Answer, everything. The Bible says Christ died for me. Why did Christ die for me and you? He died for us to pay for the sin we've committed over and over against God. And then he rose again from the dead. And right now he'll come into our lives and forgive us. And I'll tell you how to do that in just a moment. So what is the meaning of life? Well, you come into this relationship with God and you discover, I'm on this earth to know God. I'm on this earth to walk with God. I'm on this earth to have a relationship with God. And I'm here on this earth to bring him glory. Oh man, that sounds lame and boring. No, it isn't. It's the best life there is, the Christian life, following Christ. There's nothing better. I've been on both sides of the street. I've tried what this world has to offer. Some of you have as well. I've seen the emptiness of it. 
I've been walking with the Lord now for, well, over 40 years. And every day, it's an adventure walking with Jesus Christ. And I finally found the roadmap I was looking for. God gave me the user's manual of life. It's called the Bible. And I can open up and hear from God and give me the values and the beliefs I need. The Bible, B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Get your own copy and start reading it. Yeah, but Greg, what happens when we die? You know the answer to that? I actually do, because it's in the Bible. Before he died, Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, said, quote, no one wants to die. And people who want to go to heaven don't even want to die to get there. Yet death is the destination we all share. No one has ever escaped it. End quote. That's true. If anyone could have figured out a way around it, it would have been Steve Jobs. But there's no app to get out of death. The statistics on death are quite impressive. One out of every one person's will die. But then what happens? It all depends. If you're a Christian, I'll tell you what happens. When a Christian dies, they go to heaven. That's what the Bible says. They go to heaven. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and where we're not, so I would have told you. If I go, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. Where I am, you'll be also. So let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You go to heaven. The Bible says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Yeah, but heaven, isn't heaven kind of boring? You know, you're sitting around in clouds, playing harps, looking at fat little baby angels with little wings. No, no, that, that's... That's cartoon heaven, okay? The heaven of the Bible, the real heaven, is a real place for real people to do real things. It will surpass your wildest dreams. And you don't have to fear death if you put your faith in Christ because you know you'll be there one day. And if you have loved ones that have gone before you who have died in faith, you'll be reunited with them again. This is the hope of the Christian. Yeah, well, what about the non-Christian? What happens to them when they die? You may not like my answer. They go to hell. Some of you are saying, oh man, I was digging your sermon till you said that, man. Sorry, I'm just the delivery boy. I don't write this script, but I have to deliver it faithfully. You know, when I was a kid, I had a paper route. And I'd throw those papers, I learned how to clear hedges, I learned how to get them right on the front porch. I had a super cool Schwinn Stingray, ape hanger handlebars, stick shift on, it was sort of my pre-Harley vehicle, you know? I loved it. But my job was not to write the news, it was not to make the news, it was to deliver the news. And my job has not changed, I'm here to deliver the news. Yes, there is a hell. Listen to this, Jesus Christ spoke more about hell than all the other preachers of the Bible put together. He knows of its reality. And know this, the last thing God wants is for anyone to go to hell. And people will say, I don't even believe in hell. But they'll say hell all the time. You know, well, I don't, that person bugs me, they can just go to hell. Or they'll say, man, that person, they're hell on wheels. Or they got fun. We had a hell of a good time. I had a person actually come up to me and say, that was a hell of a sermon, Pastor. I'm like, okay. Thank you, I think. But it's funny, we'll say, I don't believe in hell, but we talk about hell all the time. Well, it's just not as effective to say, you can just go to a place that doesn't even exist. It's not as effective. I think it's the same reason that people use the name Jesus Christ to punctuate their sentences. I was, I talked to a guy the other day, he was delivering water at my house and he, he saw some, we have a, two rabbits and they had bunnies and he said, Jesus Christ, look at that. Then he saw something else and he said, Jesus Christ. A third time he said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Why did he say that? As he was leaving, I said, man, you talk a lot about Jesus, don't you? And I invited him to the Harvest Crusade. I said, we're gonna be talking a lot about Jesus. But why do people say that? 
even if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, in a backhanded way they're acknowledging the power of the name of Jesus that's above every name. They're effectively acknowledging belief. That's why we weren't use the word hell. Hell this, hell that. Because deep down inside, you know hell is real. Well, how could a God of love send people to hell? News flash, God doesn't send people to hell. You send yourself there. Hell was not made for people. Hell was made according to Jesus for the devil and his angels. Listen, friend, if you end up in hell one day, You'll practically have to, have to climb over Jesus to get there. We're giving you a warning. You don't have to go to this place. You can go to heaven instead. You can change your eternal address tonight if you'll believe in him. So old Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says to him, Hey, hey Jesus, um, he's wondering what his life is all about. And he tells Jesus he's a good teacher and he respects him. And Jesus just cuts to the chase. Nicodemus, let me just get to the bottom line, buddy. You need to be born again. What? Nicodemus, who's probably an old guy at this point, says, how can a man be born when he's old? How can he be born all over again? Jesus said, the wind blows wherever it wills. You can't hear the wind. You can't tell where it's coming from or where it's going. You can't explain it. But that's how people are born of the Spirit. Nicodemus asked, how are these things possible? Jesus said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, Jesus is saying to us tonight, you can change. You can start all over again. You can be born all over again. You can have your spiritual thirst satisfied if you will believe in him and you'll find the meaning of life. It can happen for you. And I'll tell you how in just a moment. One last question. Why am I so lonely? Why am I so lonely? You know, you can be in a big crowd like you are tonight and still be lonely. A lot of young people feel lonely today. The National Science Foundation reported there's unprecedented numbers of Americans feeling lonely today. One expert said our age has been called the age of loneliness. Are you lonely? Maybe you're married and you're lonely. Maybe you have a lot of friends, but you're lonely. A lot of people try to satisfy that by going online. Everybody's online now. 92% of American teenagers go online daily. 23% of their devices are on their devices constantly. Man, I know because I see it. You know, people just walk around looking at their phone all the time. Looking at the phone. Hey, I brought something to show you. It's like show and tell. I found this on my desk. This is kind of hilarious. I found my old phone. Check this out. It's a flip phone. Look at this thing. Flip phone. You could not text on this. You cannot get emails on this. You couldn't watch videos on this. You just made phone calls on this. Imagine such a thing. But now with these amazing phones that we have, they can do anything. And so people are obsessed with them. And I think a lot of people with social media are, are thinking they have a lot of friends they don't have. Look, I don't care how many followers you have on Twitter or how many friends you have on Facebook. They're actually not your friends and they're not your followers. You just have to accept that. But we sort of want to present an image of ourselves. Oh, I'm so happy. Look at me here. Look at me there. And I used a program to make myself look even a little bit better. I read an article about a young girl, 17 years old, who uh, admitted to living a lie on social media. She amassed 750,000 people following her on Instagram and had 260,000 subscribers on YouTube. And she sort of presented the perfect life. Pictures of herself on the beach, in glamorous homes, wearing bikinis, etc. In her own words, trying to say, look at me, I'm cool. And one day she just got sick of it and said it was all fake and made it all up. It's all edited and contrived. I read about one lonely boy who posted a video on Instagram saying he was going to commit suicide. He posted these words, hey, so I'm killing myself. And then he did it. Sad. Listen, 
You don't have to be lonely in life. What you're lonely for is God. And Jesus Christ is here for you right now. And he'll come and live inside of you. And you'll never be alone again. He'll walk with you through life. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. And a better translation would be, I will never, no, never, no, never leave you or forsake you. I want to close with one last question. But this one is not from us for God. This question is from God to us. It's in the Bible, the Gospel of John, a story of a man who did not have the use of his legs. He hung around by a little pool of water called the Pool of Bethesda. And there was sort of an urban myth that had been told that if you managed to get to the water when an angel appeared and touched it, you would be healed. So everyone hung around the water waiting for the angel to show up. But the angel never did show up. But one day, Jesus showed up. And he walks right up to this guy and he asks him a question. And in effect, Christ asked this question of us tonight. He asked the guy, do you want to get well? What kind of question is that to ask? Of a guy who doesn't have the use of his legs hanging around by a little body of water hoping to get healed. Do you want to get well? Of course he does. Well, no, not everyone wants to get well. Not everyone wants to change. Not everyone wants to leave the lifestyle they're in. You could restate that question along these lines. Do you want to change your life? I mean, do you really want to change tonight? I'm going to tell you how. Jesus said to the guy, all right, if you want to change, if you want to get well, pick up your little mat, you lie on, and follow me. Well, this guy can't walk. And Jesus says, get up and pick up your mat and come and follow me. This guy's like, uh, there's one problem. But this guy believed. He said, okay, and he stood right up. Something he was never able to do. He stood up and he followed Jesus. And I'm going to ask you to do the same thing tonight. To get up and follow Jesus Christ tonight. And change the course of your life. And change your history. I don't care what trajectory you've been on. I don't care what kind of home you came from. I don't care what cycle of addiction or sin runs in your family that cycle can be broken and that past can be put behind you and you can be a new person tonight in jesus christ by believing in him you say but okay how how well jesus answered it when he talked to nicodemus how nicodemus says how can a guy change he says hey for god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Here's what you need to do. Number one, you would need to admit you're a sinner. Every one of us have sinned. Every one of us have broken God's commandments. Every one of us have fallen short of his standards. You might say, yeah, Greg, maybe I, I've sinned, but I'm not as bad as a person sitting next to me. That may be true. But one sin is enough to keep you out of heaven. And trust me, you've committed a lot more than one sin. You're a sinner. The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. Number two, you need to realize that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died on the cross for your sin. I told you, he came on this rescue operation. He died for the sin of the world. As Christ said, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. But listen, friend, he died for you. He died on the cross for you. He shed his blood for you. It wasn't nails that held him to that cross 2,000 years ago. It was love for you, knowing that you could be forgiven. So understand, he died on the cross for you. Thirdly, you need to repent of your sin. The word repent means to change your direction. You've been walking away from God. Now it's time to turn to God. Turn from that sin. Turn from that thing that's been holding you back. And then you must receive Christ into your life. You see, being a Christian is having Jesus live inside of you. And you'll never be alone again. He'll take residence in your heart. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if, I'll, if you'll hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. But check this out. Let's say you went home tonight. And, uh, and you're getting ready for bed and you get a knock on the door, you know kind of late. Who is it? You look down there and there standing at your front door is Jesus Christ. 
See, it's kind of hard to miss him because you have a glass front door. So you see him and he sees you. It's kind of hard to act like you're not home when he sees you and you see him. Oh, hey, Jesus, how's it going? All right, love, love all your movies. Uh, you're really knocking at my door at this hour and I don't want to answer it. So maybe I'll see you tomorrow. You get up in the morning, you come downstairs, he's still there knocking at the door. Wow, you are persistent. Uh, you kind of wave, you go on your, with your business and, and you kind of keep ignoring him. Now understand, here's what's happening. He's knocking by you not opening the door. That's rejection. Well, God will just keep knocking. He, he doesn't have anything else to do. Really? You're going to blow off God like that? You're going to reject God like that? You're going to insult Jesus like that? I hope not. Like I said, I heard those words years ago as a kid. Jesus said, you're for me or against me. This is an either or proposition. This is yes or no. This is open the door or leave the door shut in his face. What do you want to do? Oh man, don't leave that door shut. Open it. Receive Christ into your life. And then you must do it publicly. And that's why I'm going to ask you to do what 3,000 people did last night. In a few moments, I'm going to ask you if you want to know the meaning of life. If you want to fill the emptiness inside of you. If you don't want to be lonely anymore. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and walk down in this field and stand behind this stage. And when you all get here, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. A prayer of asking Christ to come into your life. So you get ready. Because it's coming. You say, well, Greg, I, that's kind of a long ways. I'm up here in the nosebleed section. That'll take me a while. I don't know if I want to walk that far. Why do I need to go down there? Here's why. Jesus said, if you will acknowledge me before people, I'll acknowledge you before my Father and the angels in heaven. But then he added, if you deny me before people, I'll deny you before the Father and the angels. This is a way to acknowledge him publicly, to say, I don't care who sees, I am going to follow Jesus and it's going to start tonight. And I mean business. That's why I ask you to come. And you will mark this night as the greatest night of your life. You'll mark it in time. That was the night I believed in Jesus. And lastly, you must do it now. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Tonight's your night. Don't put it off. Don't say, well, you know what? I'll, I'll do it tomorrow night. I'll come Sunday night. Yeah, come on Sunday night. But don't wait till then. Now is your moment. This is your time to come to Jesus. Yes, to find the meaning of life. Yes. To fill that hole in your heart. You'll never be alone again. But now the ball's in your court, friend. Now you have to decide. Remember, this is yes or no. This is accept or reject. This is open the door or leave it closed. And listen to me. Yes, this is heaven or hell. You decide where you'll spend eternity by what you do with Jesus. Make the right decision. Come to Christ tonight. And you can know you'll go to heaven when you die. Let's pray. Father, we've heard the word of scripture. Now I pray for every person here in this stadium. I pray for every person listening, every person watching, wherever they are. Help them to see their need for you. Help them to come to you. Help them to believe in you. We would ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. All right. Now listen. Listen very carefully. If you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want that big hole in your heart filled, if you want to find life's meaning, I'm going to ask you right now, wherever you are, to get up out of your seat and make your way into the nearest aisle and start coming down to this field. Wherever you're sitting, get up and start coming down to this field to make your public stand for Christ. Wherever you are up there in the top section, you get up and come down. We'll wait till you all get here. And listen, I'm going to ask a huge favor of my Christian friends. I don't want anybody leaving early. This is what this event is all about. Yeah, we had awesome music with the bands and 
you heard a message, but it's not about all that. It's about this moment when people come to Christ. Let's keep the aisles open. The only movement I want to see is the movement of people coming down on the field to make that stand of faith. So you stay there and you pray. You pray for the person in front of you. You pray for the person behind you. And you pray for the person on your left and on your right because they may not know Jesus. And their eternal destiny is hanging in the balance on what they do with Christ right now. You pray they make the right decision. Get up and come. You're not too old to come to Christ. Nicodemus was an old dude, but he came to Jesus and he believed. You're not too young to come to Christ. If you've understood what I've said, even if you're a kid, you come on. Jesus loves the little children. He'll forgive you. He'll come into your life. Listen, you're not good, too good to come to Christ. Well, Greg, I'm a moral person. Yeah, but you're not moral enough. Well, I'm a good person. Yeah, maybe, but you're not good enough. Everybody needs Jesus. You come as well. But you're not too bad to come to Christ. You say, Greg, you don't know what I've done. No, I don't know what you've done, but I know what he did for you. He died on the cross for all of your sins. So you come with your sins tonight and he'll forgive you. Come with your problems. Come with your addictions. Come with your questions. Come to Jesus. Step into that aisle. Make your way down here to the field. We'll wait till you all get here. And then we'll pray together. Maybe you've fallen away from the Lord. You're a prodigal son or daughter. You can come back home tonight. You can return to the Lord tonight. You get up and come as well. God says, come you backsliding children and I will heal you, says the Lord. You come as the band sings. Come broken heart, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come in. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't heal. So lay down. The Bible says, harden not your heart if you can hear his voice. 
How do you harden your heart by saying, no way. I don't want this. I don't want Jesus. I don't want forgiveness. Hey, God's not going to force you to believe. You have a choice in the matter. You cast the deciding vote here. The Holy Spirit is sort of tugging on your heart. You can say yes or you can say no. I don't know why you're saying no. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to take that big weight off your shoulders, but like that guy, Jesus talked to you. Hey, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to change? And get up. You don't have to get up. You can stay in your sin. You can stay in your addiction. You can stay in your misery. You can go to hell if you want to. God doesn't want you to. He wants you to join him in heaven because he loves you. But you must come. There might be more of you. You're saying, there's no way I'll do this. But you can do it still. I told you, I thought to myself, I, I would never do this. I could never do this. And I did it. And I've never, even for a moment, regretted that decision. And you can make that same decision and follow Jesus. So get up. Step into that aisle. Make your way down to the field. We will wait until every one of you gets down here because this is why we're here. <laughs> we'll wait for you, so come on. Especially if you're in those top sections, it takes you longer. Come on. There's joy for the morning, oh sinner be still. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow, the heaven can't heal. So lay down your shame. Lay down your shame. Oh, you are good. Lift up your shame. There's still time for you to come. A worship band is going to do another song. And hey, if it takes 10 songs, we'll sing them for you to get down here, all right? I don't think it will, but we would. You guys would do 10 songs, wouldn't you? Sure you would. So you come. We're here for you. We love you. We want you to know Jesus. We're praying for you to come. Many are coming, you can see it. Look at all these people. These are answers to prayers before your very eyes. Look at all these people, they all have a story. And their story is gonna change. And now their story is gonna have a happy ending because they invited Jesus into their story. And you can do it too. So you get up and come if you haven't started yet. Thank you. 
Wow. I'll tell you what, God's Holy Spirit is at work in Angel Stadium tonight. Look at all these people coming down. Unbelievable. You guys ready for eight more songs? I'm kidding. I think one more will do it. We'll wait till everyone gets down. Because every one of these folks is precious to God. Jesus told a story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one went astray. The shepherd didn't say, oh yeah, you know, win a few, lose a few, who cares? I still have 99. No, Jesus said that shepherd went searching until he found that lost lamb and wrapped it around his neck and brought it back rejoicing. God's always going after that last one because he loves us as individuals. He wants to change your story. Hello, everybody. God bless all of you. We're so glad you came. You made the right decision. You really did. I know some of you are thinking, oh man, you know, what am I getting myself into? Hey, this is about who's getting himself into you. Jesus is going to come and live inside of you now and be your Savior and your Lord and your friend and You'll never be alone again. I'm going to lead you in a really simple prayer. And I'm going to ask that you would just pray this prayer out loud after me. And this is a prayer where you're asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sin. And then you're asking Him to come into your life. And then you're saying you're going to follow Him. And listen, God's going to hear this prayer. And God's going to answer this prayer if you mean it from your heart. So if you would, please, I want you all to bow your heads and you can close your eyes if you like. But pray this prayer out loud after me. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud right now. Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. But I know that you are the Savior who died on the cross for my sin. And paid the price for the wrongs I've done. Jesus, come into my life. I turn from my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. I choose to follow you, Jesus, from this night forward. Be my Savior and my Lord. Be my God and my friend. Thank you for accepting me and forgiving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless every one of you. God bless you. God bless you. Wow. Hey, listen. Every one of you that is on the field, I have a gift for you tonight. It's called the Start Bible. See, I'm holding one here in my hand. It's a red Bible with a white cover. And uh, we have one of these for you to take home and start reading. This is the New Testament with some notes that I wrote. It's kind of custom designed for someone just like yourself to start reading. So we have one of these for you. Don't leave the field without your own start Bible. It's red with a white arrow. You can't miss it. Listen, here's what you need to know now that you've asked Jesus to come into your life. Number one, you need to start reading the Bible. As I said, this is the instruction manual of life you've been looking for. Start reading the Bible every day. Open up the Bible. You can even start with the Gospel of John. It's the fourth Gospel in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Start reading that. Then keep reading all the way through the Bible. Read the Bible because God will speak to you through it. Number two, you need to pray. And prayer is so amazing because it's just talking to God. You can pray wherever you are. And by the way, you don't have to speak in flowery language. God knows all the latest slang terms. He understands what you're saying. So just start talking to God. Bring your needs before God. Your problems are for God. Start praying. Number three, you need to get involved in a church. And we have a list of great churches in the area that... You can go be a part of it. And tomorrow is Sunday. I want all of you to go to church on Sunday. Tomorrow. Some of you for the first time ever. Go to church. 
Go say hello to the pastor and say, I accepted Jesus last night at the Harvest Crusade, and I'm a Christian now. Go to church. You need to be a part of a church. And lastly, go tell someone. Tell someone what God has done for you tonight. Standing near you is what I like to call a friend. You haven't met them yet, but they're your friend. Sometimes we call them counselors. But really, they're just people here to help you. They have little badges, stickers on their shirts. They're pink. It says decision follow-up. And these are folks that have been trained to encourage you. They also have your start Bible. Look there in the screen. You see Brad's, you know, rocking the pink sticker. And I like that. And so these are people that are here to help. So we're going to give you one of these start Bibles. So we have one for everyone. So right now, uh, counselors start looking around for folks that need a start Bible. And you people that want to get one of these Bibles, look around. The counselors are holding the start Bibles up. Just look around. You'll see someone holding up a Bible. Make your way to the person. All the counselors, hold your Bibles up right now. Hold your start Bibles up. Okay, now folks, look for people holding Bibles. Walk toward that person. Walk toward that person. And the counselors, make your way to the nearest people. Give them that Bible. Introduce yourself to them. Folks, don't leave the field tonight without a start Bible. We have one for you. I know there's a lot of people. Just be patient. We'll get you your start Bible. God bless all of you. And welcome to the family of God.